I've been doing a literature review of all classification systems for altered states of consciousness over the last year or so, on top of the previously established subjective effect index that I've written. Uh, it's included going through a lot of books, a lot of psychometric scales, consulting on a bi-weekly basis with Andy Newberg, who is the world's leading expert in the neurological study of religious and mystical experiences. And we have compiled a list of 30 or so mystical and transpersonal experiences, primarily in relation to those which are induced by hallucinogens, psychedelics, and I suppose occasionally meditation. I'll read the definition for mystical and transpersonal experiences now, and then I'll have my partner slash assistant here read the definitions for each individual effect, and I will arrange them into a tier list based on my own arbitrary opinion and personal bias. Both of us have put a lot, lot of work into this. Mystical and transpersonal experiences affect the way we relate to our place in the universe, our conceptions of truth, reality, and consciousness, and the context of our own existence and existence itself. The highest manifestations of these effects can be called spiritual, transcendent, religious, or transformative experiences. Right quick, the reference materials that we used in particular for this were uh, the MEQ-30, which is a psychometric scale, Antipodes of the Mind by Benny Shannon, Groff's Realms of the Human Unconscious, and Direct Working with Andrew Newberg. So for the first effect, it is atemporality, a feeling of being outside of or unaffected by linear time. A person experiencing this effect will feel that there is no flow of time and that time itself is a meaningless concept. I've experienced this effect myself a number of times. It often accompanies mystical and transpersonal experiences and it can feel mystical and transpersonal in the sense that when you experience it, it feels as if you're being ex exposed to eternity. But in and of itself, it doesn't necessarily have to be a mystical or transpersonal experience. Because of that, I think I would rank this one as merely C tier. Mm -hmm. Ego death is a vague colloquial term that doesn't have a consensus meaning. In the context of psychedelics, ego death typically refers to some kind of disruption of selfhood or identity. With the term ego death, I've done a lot of research into the history of the term and I found myself getting quite annoyed at it because it seems that it can mean anything to anyone at any time. People use it to refer to states of unity in which I would say that your sense of self is actually expanded, not diminished. They can use it to just mean breaking through on DMT. They can use it to mean losing one's sense of self, but it seems to be such a nebulous and colloquial term that doesn't have a defined meaning that I'm gonna put this one in F tier. Whoa. Bold. I know. <laughs> Absent selfhood is a complete lack of identity. This state is characterized by a profound experience of remaining fully conscious while there is no longer an I experiencing sensory <clears throat> input. There is just sensory input as it is and by itself, without a conscious agent to comment on or think about what is happening to it. When I say ego death, personally, I am referring to absent selfhood. I think that's the one that makes the most sense to refer to as ego death because, well, your, your sense of self is absent, it has died, it's dissolved, whatever. I think this effect is pretty helpful. It's like turning a computer on and off again. I think it's essential for people to experience this effect at some point in their lives. My one complaint with it is that often people will undergo this effect and then afterwards they'll go for a sort of contradictory, arrogant state of mind where they think that they've been through ego death more than other people and therefore they are enlightened and they are better than all the people around them and you wouldn't believe how small their ego is because they've been through so much ego death. So. As a result of that, I'm going to put this one in B tier. Fractured selfhood. A progressive process of a person's sense of self dividing in two, and each fragment dividing in two repeatedly until their identity is completely scattered. The fragments may be perceived as coalescing back together as this effect ends. This is another form of ego death. It's, well, I guess your ego is being disrupted and destroyed in some manner. It's it's a pretty obscure one, and I haven't heard too many people report it, but it seems that as your ego fragments into smaller and smaller subsections, eventually you lose your conception of self entirely, and it leads into something more akin to absent selfhood. I think it's pretty neat. It's a little too obscure for my taste. I wish it was too common. I mean, more common, rather. So I'm going to put this in C tier. Unity and interconnectedness an augmentation of a person's sense of self or identity. This effect causes a person to perceive their own identity as including one or more additional components, such as an object, another person, immediate surroundings, concepts as nature or humanity, etc. 
At the extremes, the self can be expanded to include a person's conceptions of everything that, ever, that has ever or will ever exist, resulting in a state of unity. I already did a video on this. This is my favorite subjective effect of all time. I think it's extremely significant. I feel that if we scientifically figured out how to consistently induce and sustain this effect, that it would completely change society and the history of humanity forever. It's a little overplayed, which makes me kind of want to put it in B tier, but since it's my favorite, I'm going to put it in S tier. Understandable. Perception of eternalism, which is a state of mm. feeling like the full entirety of time has always been and always will be real and occurring simultaneously, but with a chronological orientation. For example, although a butterfly is and always has been oh, and always will be an egg, a caterpillar, a chrysalis, and a butterfly simultaneously, the butterfly's perpetual temporal existence will remain in that order. This is one of my favorite mystical or transpersonal experiences of all time. For me personally, it's pretty consistently accompanied level four states of unity and interconnectedness. And when I've undergone this, it's felt the the passage of time from past, present to future is an illusion and that all time frames exist simultaneously, eternally. Um, I experienced this multiple times on ayahuasca and upon looking into it, it seems that eternalism and growing block theory of the universe is actually the modern understanding of how time is more likely to work according to theoretical physics, which I do not claim to understand in any way. It's also interesting that high-level physicists like Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking seem to advocate for the perception of linear time as uh, humans experience it from their subjective perspective as being an illusion in exactly the same way. So I've always found that interesting. And I also like that this particular mystical effect, in my mind, gives me a materialist answer to life after death because although my life will not continue indefinitely across the entire time frame it does feel to me that it will exist forever within the time frame that it occurred in there's a really good song in the finale of adventure time the cartoon show that talks a lot about this effect and i love that song and it made me cry so i'm gonna put this effect in a tier Okay, next one is existential culmination, which is a distinct and profound feeling that a person's entire life has been building up to the present moment. This is it. This is an, an effect that particularly relates to the entirety of the universe or anything like that, but I've been through this effect a number of times and I've seen many people go through this effect. And what I refer to it as as a teenager, or me and my friends refer to it as, was getting off the train syndrome. It's like you've been on a train your entire life and you're finally getting off the train and it's a cause for celebration. It feels extremely profound in that moment. I think it's a great effect. It's very fun. So I'm going to put this one in C tier. Mm. Next one is perception of synchronicity. <laughs> An experience of noticing and assigning significance or meaning to circumstances or events in the outside world that are similar to each other or, they, or that may be perceived as being reactive to each other despite having no obvious causal link. I have some thoughts and feelings about this one. I do believe that obscure examples of synchronicity or very unlikely examples of synchronicity could be embedded within how the universe functions somehow, but I don't know for sure. And most accounts of synchronicity that I hear from people feel like they are actually more just coincidences that are being reinterpreted as some sort of profound synchronicity through their silly pattern-seeking monkey brain. So as a result of that, I'm gonna put this effect in D tier. Existential reaffirmation is a moment of being compelled to acknowledge and revel in the realness or significance of a person's own existence. This effect happens to me quite consistently under the influence of dissociatives. Whenever I go through this effect, it feels like I've been sleepwalking and I'm now waking up. I think, wow, I'm me, I exist, I have this life, I have these friends, I'm doing these things. Isn't that amazing? I just realized that I am me and it feels very reinvigorating and it feels very exciting. And I always find it to be just refreshing in general, although it isn't profound in the same way that something like eternalism or unity might be. So, because of that, I think I'm going to put this one in C tier. Do you think it might be interacting with your depersonalization? Hmm. Probably. I realize that derealization and depersonalization like, can be like different <laughs> things. 
but uh, they're often in some way kind of con con kind of connected. Yeah, I think when I'm going through existential reaffirmation, on some level, my depersonalization is probably decreasing somewhat, mm -hmm. and in a way that you might not expect, my depersonalization does tend to go down more on dissociatives than it does on psychedelics. Interesting. No, I, I can totally see that. Yeah, I'm not sure why. Yeah. It seems to interact with my depersonalization more directly than a psychedelic would. The dissociative experience does, I mean. I think ex uh, experiences with, with nature tend to make me feel this existential reaffirmation. Hmm. Like a sunset can really like in invigorate that kind of feeling for me. Yeah, I could see that. For me, it tends to just happen in my bedroom hmm. while on dissociatives with no particular trigger. Hmm. Perception of hmm. death is an experience of a person perceiving themselves as progressively dying or already dead in a spiritual or literal sense, often with accompanying visual and or tactile hallucinations. This effect is often followed by a perception of rebirth. This effect can be pretty horrifying while you're undergoing it. I've done some reading into it and it seems that it's often accompanied by hallucinations of dying. There's also a version of this effect that isn't a mystical or transpersonal experience, it's just a delusion. Often people will be coming up on a psychedelic and they'll think, oh no, I'm dying, or I've gone insane, or I've taken a poison and it's killing me. But this kind of exists in contrast to it, although it's quite similar to it, and it's the experience of actually dying. And it tends to lead into people um, overcoming their fear of death, or entering into some sort of transformative hallucinatory state. So. Since this one's pretty hardcore, I'm going to put it in B tier. Okay, next up, perception of rebirth. An experience of a person perceiving themselves being reborn in a spiritual or literal sense, often with accompanying visual and or tactile hallucinations. This effect typically results in persistent feelings of transformation and rejuvenation. This effect can take quite a few different forms. Sometimes it's a literal hallucination of being reborn. I read a lot in Stanislav Grof's um, classification of sy classification systems of transpersonal states and he would talk a lot about people experiencing being in the womb and experiencing being reborn. I personally have experienced that. I once experienced myself aging backwards all the way until I was a baby and then I became age zero and went to before I was born and when I went to before I was born it was a state of unity with my entire framework of existence, which was the universe at large. And it was a really profound experience for me, although terrifying when I was young and didn't know what was going on. So I'm gonna put this, hmm, where should I put this? Okay, I'm gonna put this in B tier. So one of the, like, cause you had, you've had very few unity experiences. And so one of them was coupled with a, a rebirth experience. Yeah, exactly one of them. Oh, another thing I want to talk about with this effect is often it's more of a metaphor. People will just think, it feels like I've been reborn in you. Sometimes they'll even be inspired to change their name. They just feel that they've entered a new chapter of their life. There was no literal hallucination of being reborn. This is a Dumergo getter. Your births don't seem like they last. You feel all good for a week or two and then you're back to the old self. Yeah, I've experienced this with psychedelics quite a lot, so I, I try to tell people that they're not a miracle cure. Often, while I'm tripping, I think that all of my problems are permanently solved, because in my current headspace, uh, they just don't affect me anymore. And then I come down, and it turns out that I was just tripping balls, and that can be disappointing. So I encourage people to temper their expectations when it comes to being miraculously healed by psychedelics, although they are very helpful. Yeah, and I guess when it comes to those, like, a kind of more limited afterglow situations, <laughs> kind of like taking it as a positive thing that you're getting, even if it doesn't last forever, it doesn't have to last forever mm -hmm. for you to take good things from it, from that yeah. experience. Yeah, usually you have to put it into action. Reduced fear of death is a decrease in feelings of anxiety about a person's <laughs> own mortality. This one's pretty great. It's been well studied in <clears throat> uh, patients with terminal cancer, and it seems to be pretty good at what it does and sustains itself at least for months. So since this one is so incredibly useful and fear of death and accepting one's own mortality is such a huge universal part of life, I think I'm actually going to put this effect in A tier. Yeah. Uh, the Dumer Go-Getter <laughs> says, yes, that's why I stopped doing psychedelics. They didn't heal me like I expected and kind of worsened my mental health. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, really depending on how one uses it and what one's expectations are, there definitely can be negative effects in, in some cases with uses of psychedelics. I'd advise using them sparingly, and when you get the message, hang up the phone. That's a great, 
great phrase that I remind myself of quite often. Perception of interdependent opposites is a feeling that reality is based on a binary system in which meaningful concepts and situations can only logically exist through the coexistence of their opposites. Hmm. Yeah, I tend to experience this quite a lot when I am going through ego death, and it's quite consistently accompanied states of unity for me. I've heard many other people report it, so it's not something that's specific to me. Um, good examples of this is you can't have up without down, you can't have something without nothing, you can't have hot without cold, etc. Pain without pleasure. Pain without pleasure, yep, that's another good one. When I've been through it personally, um, what I experience is the psychedelics telling me that this system of opposites presupposing each other is what birthed the universe itself, because you can't have nothing without something and you can't have something without nothing. So there was nothing and then something arose from it and eventually it will return to nothing and the cycle will just continue to repeat eternally. I have no scientific basis for that, it's just something that ayahuasca seems to insist is true sometimes. So I'm gonna put this effect in A tier. Perception of causal determinism is a feeling that every event that has ever or will ever take place where the inevitable outcome of prior or co-occurring events in a complex causal chain that can be traced back to the beginning of time. This is an effect that I experience somewhat commonly, particularly if I'm going through ego death and I'm slowly being reassembled into a being that can <clears throat> interact with my external environment. I quite strongly feel that I am an electrochemical machine that's responding to sensory input with pre-programmed responses and that free will is merely an illusion and that we are all being pushed around from causes and effects in a manner that started at the beginning of the universe and that we have no control over. It doesn't really say anything particularly profound about the universe, but this effect does reconfirm my already pre-established view on how existence works. So for that reason alone, I'm going to put it in A tier. Uh, I guess when it comes to that one, there, broadly speaking, there's two kinds of ways to take that. That either mm -hmm. things happened, would they happen because it was inevitable? Yeah. Or because that's how it's supposed to be, that's how it's meant to be. So it's kind of like a, a more like I'm powerless and being dragged through existence mm -hmm. and so is everything else versus um, everything is as it should be and that's that's good. Yeah, I guess I usually see it the, fir the first way. Mm. Um, since I am depersonalized, I don't actually feel what I consider to be an illusion of free will. I'm talking right now, words are coming out of my mouth, but it just feels like an autonomous process that I can't really control. I try and move my hand in front of my face, it doesn't feel like I'm doing it. I remember being personalized as a teenager and it felt like I was an ego inside a body with a sense of agency and free will and I could manipulate the external environment around me. So I do remember what it feels like to have that illusion as I refer to it as, but I don't have it anymore and in my opinion it is just something that the brain generates rather than something that's integral to how humans exist in the world. To be clear, because I'm sure people would assume uh, you started experiencing depersonalization before you began experimenting with psychedelics. Yeah, I started not... experiencing it at the age of 14 and I started tripping at the age of 17. Yeah, so, so there's not a causative mm -hmm. thing there. Perception of sacredness is a perception that something, a moment, object, person, concept, etc. is significant in a way that transcends the mundane for example, relating to divinity, mysticism, ancestors, magic, etc. And this is uh, coupled with compulsion to revere that thing. This is a very common experience under the influence of psychedelics, even at lower levels. It tends to make people appreciate things like nature more than they did otherwise. I don't really personally believe that anything is sacred, but I do really enjoy this experience. So I'm going to put it at C tier. For me, I was raised in a very kind of oppressive religious culture and I don't tend to perceive things as sacred in that way because my associations with divinity are pretty negative. Ah, that um, makes sense. But I do kind of like have this kind of other feeling that things are like special. Yeah. But that's more how I feel about it myself. Mm -hmm. I think that things are sacred because people <clears throat> perceive them as such and perceiving something as sacred makes it sacred rather than sacredness being an inherent property of that thing that exists outside of the minds of sentient beings who come up with that concept and apply it to it. Okay, so this one's quite similar. Reverence <laughs> is a feeling of actively regarding something as important and worthy of honor or deference. Yeah, this one's very similar to sacredness. I was trying to figure out 
what the specific opposites of this thing are and I think that an experience of sacredness does generally lead you to revere it but to revere something is not the same as viewing it as sacred. I think somebody could revere something such as a natural system or a societal institution, but not view it as inherently sacred. So while sacredness usually includes reverence, reverence does not always include sacredness. And since it's a pretty simple effect, I'm just gonna put this one in D tier. I have nothing against it, but it's just not that amazing. Just not, not quite good enough. Yeah. yeah. Perception of divine presence is a feeling that a person has attracted the attention of a divine consciousness who is now physically nearby. This one can occur in many different ways. There's often a sense during mystical and religious experiences that there is just a divine presence. There is a god or a deity or something non-specific that is some sort of divine consciousness nearby. Sometimes it is more specific than that. For example, people might hallucinate meeting a god or deity and they will know and feel that that deity that they are meeting is divine but it can manifest in either way. I'm gonna put this effect as probably just D tier hmm. because I, I don't think they're genuinely divine so I don't think there's a true insight there Yeah, that's fair. but it's not terrible so I'll just leave it there. Existential dread is a persistent feeling of questioning the meaning or worth of a person's own existence, coupled with an absence of hope for finding satisfying answers. Hmm. So it's really hard to rank this one, because it's a, it's a bad feeling, but at the same time existential dread can be useful. It sometimes allows people to sort of come up with their own meaning. I suppose that's the whole point of existentialism. So it can be useful, but it's also a negative experience and it can go either way. Um, it's difficult to put this in any particular ranking in a way that none of the others are. I'm gonna put this in C tier, so just mm. right in the middle. Yeah, I guess like existential dread can be a good thing to have experienced, but only insofar as someone gets to the other side of it. Yeah, it's not a good thing yeah. to currently be experiencing, for sure. Yeah, and being in it for too long, I think, mm -hmm. can have some psychic mm -hmm. damage. Yeah, and it can happen on multiple different levels. You could lose your religious faith and then go through existential dread. You could feel that the world is a meaningless and cruel place, and that's why you're experiencing existential dread. Or you could just lose your job, and that's why you're going for existential dread. So it can happen on a lot of different levels. Definitely. It's a pretty broad series of experiences. Yeah. Spirituality enhancement. It's an increased perception of spiritual significance in a person's surroundings, situation, existence, and place in the universe. I think that this is an effect that people go through pretty consistently if they start using psychedelics on any kind of a regular basis. It happens to such an extent that I think that there is some sort of neurological drive within human brains to start assembling bigger picture context to how their life fits in to their model of reality in order to give them a greater sense of meaning and purpose. My only problem with this effect is that when people go through it, if they don't have a rational and grounded viewpoint of reality, they'll start coming up with all these crazy theories about how the world works that are often incredibly pseudoscientific and new agey to the point that I tend to refer to this as McKenna syndrome because although Terence McKenna is one of my my heroes he definitely had a pretty severe case of McKenna syndrome I've been through McKenna syndrome myself it started giving me this profound urge to analyze what I called prepackaged spiritual ideologies, which are actually just religions, identify their consistent constituent components, such as uh, life and death, morality, God, a creation myth, and come up with spiritually satisfying reason-based answers to each of those, which were devoid of anything that I saw as mythology, and then to publish that on the internet as an open source religion, which was modular and people could make distros of uh, Linux OS style to come up with their own prepackaged spiritual ideologies. And that's what it started driving me to do. That project never came to fruition, but it was interesting to feel that I was going through McKenna syndrome and to try and just see where it took me while also trying to stay grounded and rational. So I think spirituality is really important to give people meaning and purpose, and I don't think it's an inherently bad thing. 
but at the same time it can cause people to completely lose touch with reality in ways that I don't think are necessarily healthy. So with that in mind, I'm going to put this at B tier. A couple things in the comments. What is McKenna syndrome? McKenna syndrome is when people use a lot of psychedelics and it activates the spirituality theory creation drive and they start coming up with all these wild ideas that are very pseudo-scientific and uh, out of touch with reality and that starts being their basis for how they view the world around them. As a follow-up on that, do you think McKenna syndrome is bad? <clears throat> I think most of the time it's bad, but I don't think it's inherently bad. I think McKenna syndrome is often bad because people don't have a sense of skepticism or they're not very compelled to look at things, I don't know, through the lens of reason and it can cause them to become detached from reality. But I think people that are quite grounded when they go through McKenna syndrome, it can result in very interesting things that are beneficial for them and beneficial for the people around them. But most of the time, I think it's a bad thing. It kind of reminds me of, I guess, like other things when it comes to altered states of consciousness and especially kind of in extreme or intense mind altering substances that if one can handle it in a grounded way, mm -hmm. then you know things can be good, like having that sort of inclination to explore different kinds of ideas and all of that. But aside from that, if someone isn't able to handle it in a way that's healthy for themselves and others, then a lot of these things can become very bad for a lot of people. Do you think McKenna was wrong? Yeah, I mean, I love Terence McKenna, but I don't personally believe that, say, psilocybin mushrooms are an intergalactic being that reproduces by spreading itself from planet to planet by inspiring the sentient beings that eat it to become spacefaring civilizations, thus bringing its spores to other celestial bodies. I don't think that's true. I don't think DMT entities or machine elves exist outside of the human mind. I don't think consciousness is an antenna, or at least I think it's probably not an antenna. There's a lot of things I disagree with McKenna on. But he was my inspiration for this entire project, and I have a massive amount of respect for him. I just have a different worldview than he does. But I love Terence McKenna. If it wasn't for him, I would not have started this project. Perceived exposure to inner mechanics of consciousness is an experience of feeling that a person is witnessing, visually, conceptually, etc., the underlying mechanics of their own mind and consciousness, which can lead to perceived improvements in understandings <laughs> of a person's own interior processes. This one's really interesting. When I go through it, how it usually feels to me is that I am witnessing innately readable geometric representations of my interior conscious processes that represent how my thoughts function, how memories are encoded, how my emotions and thought streams are manifesting or generally working. And it feels that I'm gaining this great insight into how the conscious mind works. And it's very profound that I have a greater understanding of how the brain works. But then of course, when I come down, I can never verbalize any of these thoughts in any kind of a way that's genuinely useful. And it seems that people experience this a lot, but they also experience that they can't really verbalize it. So while I do think that it's a lot like, say, if you don't know how to use CSS or HTML code and you right click on a web page and click inspect and look at the code, you can see that, ah, yes, this is the, the inner workings of how this web page works, but I don't understand any of it and it's not giving me any insightful information. So I think it's quite analogous to that. I'm going to put this effect in B tier because it's really interesting, but it's hard to gain anything useful from it. Perceived exposure to the semantic concept network is an experience of feeling that a person is witnessing, visually, conceptually, etc., the interconnected web of all the concepts, memories, etc., that exist in their own mind and consciousness, which may lead to sensory overload. This used to be classified within an older version of the Subjective Effect Index that is still found on Psychonaut Wiki, the, a website that I founded that's currently five years out of date. I used to think that this was level 8A psychedelic geometry with the previous effect that we just described as being level 8B geometry and that when geometry reached level 7 it could branch off into these two separate pinnacles of psychedelic geometry. I now realize that that's not the case so I just wanted to correct that here because sometimes people still bring up level 8A and level 8B geometry to me in the comments and such. Now I realize that they are their own things. They don't have to manifest through geometry. They can manifest through synesthesia or conceptual 
thoughts and feelings that you just kind of intuitively feel and understand. But as for the effect itself, when I go for it personally, my brain will lock onto a concept, say the concept of internet. I'll see that represented through a geometric form and then it will branch out into other associated concepts such as, I don't know, computers, technology, etc. And those will branch out into their associated concepts and it will do that near infinitely until it encompasses my entire internal database of semantic concepts, at which point I'll feel that I am seeing and feeling and have become everything. Not in the sense that I am going through a state of unity with the universe, just in the sense that every concept that's stored in my brain is being represented to me all at once with the initial concept that activated that branching out process being in the middle as a central node. And at that point, I just feel like, whoa, this is everything that has ever existed. And it's incredibly profound. It's very overwhelming. I don't really learn much from it, but it's it's amazing. I used to go through it quite consistently while you go that thing on LSD. Um, I've been for it dozens of times, but for whatever reason, I haven't actually experienced this effect in about nine years. It doesn't seem to happen consistently for me anymore. I would love to experience it again, though. I'm going to put this on A tier. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> was that a lot? Yeah, that was like a, a really cool description of a really interesting experience. Oh, thanks. I was just rambling, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> Perception of telepathy is a perception of transmitting and or receiving thoughts and feelings hmm. to or from another via supernatural or paranormal means. Okay, so I have a lot of thoughts and feelings about this one. I've been through it myself. People talk about it a lot to me, and they often act uh, as if it somehow discredits the materialist framework. In terms of telepathy as a concept, I am open to the idea of things or small amounts of information that humans aren't consciously aware of being transmitted between individuals through a combination of subtle body language that we don't perceive. I am also open to the idea of primate brains kind of syncing up to a degree which we don't necessarily expect or that is not yet understood by science. However, I do not believe that information can be wirelessly transmitted via magic between human brains. I don't think that's a thing. I also think that a lot of this is more just losing your theory of mind. You lose, you lose the innately understood idea that other people know things that you don't and vice versa. And when you lose that, it can feel like the people around you are experiencing the same things as you and that they also know everything you're thinking. And when you're tripping on a psychedelic, that can then be sort of extrapolated into this idea of telepathy, which probably isn't actually happening. So I think that most perceptions of telepathy are actually delusions of telepathy. And for that reason, I'm gonna put it in F tier. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Ineffability okay. is the idea that a concept, feeling, or experience must not or cannot be described because of its complexity, abstractness, or significance. This is a common facet of mystical and transpersonal experiences. It's actually pretty well defined within the mystical experience question at 30, MEQ 30. I don't think that it's inherently a transpersonal effect in and of itself, but it's an emotion that very commonly is associated with the experience of a transpersonal or mystical effect. I do think it's a little bit self-defeating, and I do think that these experiences can be described in a much higher level of detail than people assume that they can be. We just need to develop a universal terminology set that which we can build upon first, which is the entire basis of this project. And I think that people get too wrapped up in this idea that these things are inherently ineffable and that you cannot describe them. Because in my experience, you can describe them. It just takes a lot of time and thought. So. For that reason, I'm going to put ineffability in F tier. Not yeah. a fan. I guess there's also just the inherent <laughs> way that language reduces things. Like yeah. the inherently reductive nature of trying to take something that <laughs> is, uh, like you know, a feeling is worth a thousand words, but yeah. you only have so many words that you can actually use right. to try to describe L it. Yeah, language is inherently reductive and does not truly capture anything that it seeks to describe. But that is not unique to the psychedelic experience or a mystical experience. That is just a function of language. So I don't think it applies more to psychedelia or whatever than it does other 
subjective experiences, like experiencing emotions or flavors or scents or anything like that. For sure, yeah, and I think that really goes into the importance of establishing a consensus terminology for these things, because we're, we're used to not being able to say everything, but we're also used to using the same words as other people and being mm -hmm. able to change the way that we use words to hint at these, at these deeper experiences and feelings. Yeah. Hopefully things will become less ineffable over time. Yeah, it kind of reminds me how people used to not have a word for the color blue and that, that's quite a consistent thing throughout history but eventually we came up with a word for it and from that point forward it became quite clear that the color blue is a thing that exists and we can refer to it using this preconceived label and I think the psychedelia, the psychedelic experience will go through a very similar process as the subjective effect index becomes more mainstream and is more fully fleshed out. Merlin Makinson says perhaps there's a mirror neuron thing going on with perceived telepathy? I agree. Yeah, I haven't really as much experienced telepathy, but I've definitely had experiences where I feel very, very strongly yeah. that me and, 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 and you, for example, are mm -hmm. feeling the same thing. Yeah, uh, I think the primate brains will sync up, and I think that they may well do that quite a lot on psychedelics, and that, that explains a lot of shared hallucinations and shared experiences, and I don't think there's anything magical about it. Do you think DMT space is over time easier to process and get used to? From commenter triple this, I had a very intense DMT trip in what could only be described as sensory overload and complete ego death. Yes, it does get easier with time. It can, if you do it too much, like I have, it can even become boring. Human beings can become desensitized to anything. And that even applies to the psychedelic experience. If you're using psychedelics too much, say every weekend, multiple years in a row, eventually you just get so used to it that it's nothing special anymore, which is not a good thing, and it's not something to be proud of, but it can happen, and you certainly can get used to it. For example, when I go through ego death, my brain on a muscle memory level just seems to know that I'm going through ego death, and I'll just lay there and close my eyes, and eventually it passes. Transpersonal hallucinations are any internal or external hallucination that is mystical, spiritual, or religious in nature. These hallucinations could be of literally anything, but commonly include experiences of meeting higher beings, being exposed to past lives, or visiting realms that have a sense of profound significance. This one's a little hard for me to rank. I guess I'll just go with my instincts. What constitutes a mystical or transpersonal hallucination is kind of entirely in the eye of the beholder. For example, somebody might hallucinate meeting a god that's part of their religion and to them that is a transpersonal or mystical experience but if you're an edgy no fun materialist such as myself i could experience that in a satirical sort of hallucinatory shitpost way that i wouldn't interpret as a mystical or transpersonal experience it really does come down to how people interpret the specific thing that they went through as an individual so for that reason, since it can kind of vary from individual to individual, I'm going to put this in B tier because it's incredible to go through, but it's also very nebulous and hard to define or pinpoint as any one specific thing. A noetic insight mm -hmm. is the feeling of just knowing information without requiring evidence in a manner that may be perceived as a mystical experience, such as a psychic revelation, a message from God, etc. Noetic insights tend to accompany most of these high level transpersonal experiences you, you feel that you were gaining some kind of insight such as the self is an illusion or I don't know time is also an illusion that there is a life after death that some specific religious thing happens to be true it can be literally anything it's a little different than just introspecting about stuff and coming to conclusions it often feels that you are just intuitively gaining a very specific piece of knowledge it's not always grounded in reality a lot of time it's grounded in reality one noetic insight that i have is that the self is an illusion that one tends to come up quite a lot for me i tend to gain a lot of what I feel to be insights about how reality works, such as, I don't know, that the universe runs in a loop, that when it ends, it will eventually start again. And I feel that that is true, but when I think about it really, I have no scientific basis for that idea. I just feel like it's true because the drugs told me so. I consider that to be a noetic insight. So since it's really hard to verify these different things, but they can be very insightful, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna put this in C tier. 
This is from Merlin Meekinson. Do you believe meditation and mindfulness practices after a trip enhance the mystical experience? I always say the magic happens after the trip. Mindfulness tends to be good for yeah. pretty much all facets of human existence, so yeah, I'd suggest that that's probably true. I definitely agree that a lot of different psychedelics will induce these periods of contemplation. <laughs> if one does really take advantage of that and ponder on those thoughts later when they're going, when they're better able to organize their thoughts and mm -hmm. remember them, is definitely um, where you can get a lot of benefit. Yeah, I could see it being really useful for in integration. Yeah, definitely. Noetic truth is a noetic feeling of knowing that something, for example, message or thought, is genuinely true. So this is a pretty basic thing, so it's often you receive some sort of insight, and then accompanying that insight is just a sense that it is true. The thing may well be true, but it's also quite likely that that thing isn't true. So this can go in pretty much any direction, and there's not much else to it aside from that. So I'm going to put this in D tier. Okay, noetic realism is a noetic feeling of knowing that something, for example, an autonomous entity, mm -hmm. is genuinely real. Yeah, uh, I'm not a fan of this effect. Deranged, unhinged people keep messaging me, insisting that DMT entities are real, and despite my pretty hardline materialist perspective, uh, they think that I'm the right person to come to for those sorts of uh, conversations and queries, and uh, I think that Nine times out of ten, this sense of noetic realness being applied to things such as a hallucinatory experience in hyperspace or meeting a deity or otherworldly entity is just false. I don't think the thing is real. I think it was a real experience that you had, but I don't think it exists outside of your brain somewhere out there in the universe. So for that reason, I'm going to put this in F tier. A platonic conceptualization is a perception or mental representation of something as its most fundamental version or depiction of that thing at its core concept. This mental effect may include a hallucinatory component, may be an interpretation of something a person is viewing, or may be a form of conceptual thinking without a visual component. I've experienced this a lot. It can be good yeah. or bad. To me, unspeakable horrors kind of relate to this. Mm. Uh, I'll see representations of pure terror and horror, but it could also be representations of beauty. Uh, you, you might see, I don't know, the concept of mathematics or language and feel that that is the purest, most representative form of that concept. And it's pretty incredible. It's a really amazing thing to go through, but it doesn't offer any particularly exciting insights into how the universe works, which is what I really like to get out of a transpersonal or mystical experience. So I'm going to put this in D tier. Unfathomable beauty describes hallucinations that are characterized by overwhelmingly beautiful, intricate, and aesthetically pleasing <laughs> visuals and concepts. This one's pretty great. It's usually either looking out across the world around you, say, a natural scene and feeling that this is unfathomably beautiful, but in the context of things such as higher level psychedelic experiences, it will be hallucinations of other worlds, realms, entities, vast geometric forms that you just feel are unfathomably beautiful. They can bring you to tears with how incredible it looks. It's not particularly insightful, but it is amazing, and I love this experience, so I'm gonna put this at an A tier. I guess like it is quite kind of significant. There can be a lot of mm -hmm. benefit in, in perceiving the world in that kind of way. Yeah, you definitely. Know, like, like, why are we alive, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite effects, I think. Yeah, it seems pretty profound. <laughs> do you think it's more likely to do with the mind state of appreciating things aesthetically, or is it more about your brain actually coming up with in the most extremely beautiful visuals, literally. Like, do you know what I mean? If, if it's about perception or the actual form of the visuals themselves. I think it's a combination of the two. If you took, say, an unfathomably beautiful hallucination that a person was experiencing, and you managed to get it onto a screen that people could look at, or say a canvas, you managed to print it out as an image, it would be an incredible work of art, a masterpiece, but it wouldn't cause people to break down in tears or have the same experience and response that you had when you were experiencing it. While I do think these things are extremely beautiful, I guess it's analogous to seeing a natural scene in person, which puts you in a sort of headspace, or just seeing a photo of it. The two can't really be compared. Yeah, that's my response. Perception of self as designer 
is the okay. feeling that a person's identity has expanded to include consciousness that designed or put into motion one or more set of circumstances that affect the person, such as the course of their own life or the course of the universe as a whole. This, this one was a hard one to describe. For me, this often accompanies experiences of level four unity. So I'll feel that because my sense of self is applied to all of my internally stored model of reality being the universe throughout all points in time because it will often be applied to things in the past as well as the future i'll feel that all of that is me that since i am the universe i created the universe and i somehow designed it and i'll often feel that the universe is working towards something and that it's all carefully configured in some manner which i can't properly verbalize but it will feel to me like i designed this entire system because i am this entire system and the entire system was self-creating and self-designing so hmm in terms of where to rank this one it's really interesting but it's also a little delusional and it can lead to people becoming manic and thinking that they are literally god when things around them aren't god as opposed to thinking that everything is god including them yeah. So I'm probably going to put it on the E tier. Yeah, this is one where um, one of the people that I interviewed while trying to uh, try to really pinpoint what this effect is <laughs> talked about how um, they had had an experience where it wasn't as much everything. It was just that they felt that they were, in addition to being themselves, also an eternal being or uh, entity, uh, spirit, <laughs> something that had created their own existence. The, the course of their own life, that there was something that they are part of or that is also them that had set everything into motion. Yeah, that does also sound like it's related to unity or pantheist Yeah, but it, was, it wasn't everything, it was just themselves. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's often that my life is so perfect, not literally perfect, but in that moment it feels that everything is perfect or how it's supposed to be and that I'm living the life that I want to be living so much so that it can't be a coincidence that I happen to be in this life. I must have designed it this way and I don't necessarily believe that is true but that's certainly how it's felt. Perception of the self as illusion is a perceived realization that the nature of a person's own identity is different than they had previously believed. For example, a person may feel that their identity is a construct that resulted from their circumstances instead of being a unique essence, or they may realize that there was never any real distinction between themselves and the rest of existence. This is typically, rather than an experience or an altered state of consciousness, it's a conclusion that people very commonly come to either through noetic insight or just directly thinking about these things in a rigorous, in-depth manner. They'll come to believe that their sense of self as a separate system that is distinct from the world around it is actually a construct of the human mind and illusory in much the same way that i believe free will is an illusion i think this is really important and i think that society could benefit from more people seeing the world this way so i'm going to put it in s tier perception of <coughs> transcension a feeling of having transcended to a higher level of being and being destined to solve the multitude of world's problems using extra dimensional knowledge. This is something that I quite often go through when I am ego deathing and breaking through on a psychedelic. I, I feel that I have permanently transcended this mortal plane, that I am now living in a higher plane of existence and that nothing will ever be the same again, that I have become something greater, something more, that my consciousness has been expanded and that I now reside in the fifth dimension, beyond time, beyond space, but it always turns out that I was just tripping balls. So for that reason, I'm going to put this in E tier. It kind of reminds me of McKenna syndrome. It sounds related <laughs> to McKenna syndrome. Yeah, it's temporary McKenna syndrome. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Perception of enlightenment is the idea that one has obtained an enlightened or godlike status comparable to the Buddha or Jesus and now comprehends the simple answer to life, the universe, and everything. This individual may make claims that they have obtained a permanent enlightened status, eliminated their ego, and shall become historically noteworthy. As you might have guessed, I'm not a fan of this effect. I think that identifying as enlightened is incredibly cringe, and anyone that claims to be enlightened is not enlightened. Uh, I personally conceptualize enlightenment less as a special 
piece of information, knowledge or insight and more just a lack of delusion to the extent that you're closer to reality. But when anybody claims to be enlightened, they aren't, generally speaking, at least from personal experience, especially when it's induced by psychedelics. So this one's going straight to F tier. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Fade asks, to witness these mystical experiences, is it best to go with a solo trip or could this potentially be dangerous? Any of these substances can be dangerous. Um, there can mm -hmm. be sourcing issues. If it's something you haven't experienced yourself, you don't know how you're going to react to yeah. it. Definitely, like, s safety first. Though mm -hmm. having a, uh, a a solo trip or one with, like, minimal interaction with other people can definitely be beneficial. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that you will need a trip sitter at first, but just start with lower doses and work your way up in baby steps. There's, there's yeah. nothing inherently dangerous about it, but it can be dangerous if done recklessly. And there's nothing inherently better about heroic doses yeah. or anything. But for example, the times that you've had Unity were not necessarily times where you were, like, tripping the hardest ever. No, definitely said. not. And when it comes to mystical and transpersonal experiences in general, they are the hardest to consistently induce. You're not just definitely going to experience them. They often come spontaneously in a very unpredictable manner. So that's something that will inevitably happen to you if you start tripping on a regular basis, but don't expect it to happen the first time you trip or any time that you trip really. Yeah, and also throwing more drugs at the problem will not get you there necessarily. No. It's not a good strategy. Yeah. It's more like being open to them. 